so professional and helping out in this pandemic. It's been really difficult. I know you guys have come from far off places. A lot of times the fellows want to, you know, see the country, uh, travel, which has all been restricted uh, um, because of this. We, we used to have a lot of social events as well, which unfortunately we are unable to. I'm just waiting for this to get over and then we can have some fun. Thank you, guys. And uh, today, you know, I, I've been uh, doing this topic for the last few years, uh, uh, T for aortic surgery and AP aortic imaging. Uh, as you know, um, briefly, I'll tell, I'll talk about the outline. Uh, one is, uh, I'll talk about normal anatomy. Uh, I'll talk about aortic aneurysms, briefly the root aneurysm and descending aorta. Uh, I'll talk about aortic dissection, uh, intramural hematoma and penetrating atherosclerotic ulcers. Talk briefly about thoracoabdominal aneurysm and TVAR and use of T in these uh, situations. And uh, uh, briefly about AP aortic scanning. Uh, T is an important uh, non-invasive tool in aortic surgeries. And uh, we know that the CT scan is the first investigation uh, in, the, in the case of aortic pathologies for diagnosis. And uh, aortic dissection is one of the most common emergent situation requiring rapid and accurate diagnosis uh, to reduce morbidity and mortality. Uh, TE can be used to identify the uh, atherosclerosis of the ascending aorta uh, which is very important in preventing post-operative strokes. And uh, uh, AP aortic scanning is ideal for high-risk patients to identify sites of severe atherosclerosis on the distal ascending aorta and proximal aortic arch. Coming to the anatomy of the aorta, uh, from the TE perspective, uh, uh, the aorta can be divided into uh, six zones, one, zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five, and zone six. Uh, the, the total aorta, you know, basically you can, you can classify it as a, having an aortic root, an ascending aorta, arch, and descending thoracic aorta. From the ascending aortic aorta onwards, we have uh, six zones uh, for the T purposes and for the uh, classification purposes. For example, uh, if you take zone uh, two, zone two is the typical site of proximal anastomosis in, in CABGs. And uh, the aortic cross clamp occurs between zone two and zone three. And um, we also know that uh, zone three, four, and five are not very well imaged by the TEE because of the interposition of the trachea and the left main bronchus. And uh, the uh, also, uh, from uh, the distal to the left subclavian becomes the descending thoracic aorta. Uh, also, the, if you look at the traumatic aortic injury, the most common site of uh, blunt trauma or rapid deceleration during an operation is the aortic isthmus. It is the segment between the distal arch and the descending thoracic aorta right here. The aortic isthmus where it can, it can uh, be when the patient is involved in an accident because of rapid deceleration, it can give way. As per the ACA AC guidelines, the following uh, are the uh, clips or the images where we use to image the uh, thoracic aorta. Usually the mid esophageal short and long axis view and the upper esophageal long and short axis views are commonly used to image the aortic structures. Coming to the normal uh, parameters of aorta, uh, if you look at the annulus between 22 to 24, maximum sinus is 32 to between 32 plus or minus 4 millimeters, STJ 27 plus or minus 4 millimeters, ascending aorta 33 plus or minus 4, and descending aorta is 24 plus or minus 4. These are the normal aortic parameters based on the body surface area of 2 meter per square. I'll uh, start off briefly with uh, uh, aortic aneurysm of the root. Uh, this is one of the common operations uh, which is performed in this uh, site. Uh, the first one is the valve sparing root repair or the David operation. Uh, second one is the composite valve graft of the Benetol procedure. 
Uh, neurotic aneurysm is defined as the dilatation of aorta more than 50% of the normal aortic diameter. Uh, aneurysms are primarily diseases of aging as a result of either degeneration and atherosclerosis. Uh, aging leads to intimal thickening, lipid deposition, and calcification, leading to dilatation and weakening of aortic wall. Connective tissue disorders such as Marfan syndrome, Ehlers Danlos syndrome, and hypertension are some other causes of aneurysm. The thoracic aortic aneurysms are divided into three groups one in the aortic arch, in the ascending aorta, root, and in the descending thoracic or the thoracic abdominal aneurysm. First, coming to the aortic root aneurysm. So, the, as I said, uh, uh, AV sparing operation is a common procedure performed because it gives longe longevity to the operation and uh, prevention of uh, uh, aortic insufficiency uh, later on. So, the two operations uh, commonly performed are reimplantation technique or David procedure or remodeling technique or Yakub procedure. What happens in David procedure is in the native valve is resuspended within the Dacron graft and the coronaries are implanted later. Basically, that is the operation uh, tubular tagron graft uh, where the native aortic valve is resuspended. In a Cook's procedure, what they do is they refashion or uh, they sculpt the Dacron graft uh, to the sinuses of the uh, aortic valve and then they suture it. As you might know, uh, lo looking at the technique of the operation, the site where the sinuses are, uh, are sculpted here are the sites where it can get again aneurysmal and leading to a reoperation. That is one of the fallacies of uh, a coup technique, but it has got a place in, in the surgical uh, 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 paraphernalia. Uh, next is uh, uh, coming to the T evaluation of the aortic valve sparing surgery, uh, the single most criterion for patient selection is the morphological appearance of the aortic valve. Uh, this is best done by visual inspection by the surgeon, which is aided by perioperative TEE. So, pre CPB TEE, what, what do we have to look for in these people? One is the aortic cusp abnormalities. Number two, severity and direction of the aortic insufficiency. Number three, the root dimensions. I'll go uh, in detail for each of these. Coming to the aortic uh, cusp abnormalities. So the more important things are absence of calcification and significant cusp prolapse because these things can either restrict the motion of the leaflet or it uh, cusp prolapse leads to eccentric uh, regurgitation, which adds to the complexity of the repair. Also, thickening and thinning of the cusp, if you if you see in this image, it's, uh, stop playing, there it is, it's calcified and thickened, you know, it's very difficult for such cusps to be, you know, the valve to be repaired. A uh, lot of times in such situations, they may have to, uh, they may have to uh, uh, do a bentol procedure. Look at the cusp on this side, it's beautiful, it's thin, it's crafting nicely, it's minimal AI. This is a sort of a dream a, a aortic root aneurysm which can be repaired with Dr. David's procedure. Um, also, curled out edges, like I don't know who was there with me yesterday, there was a patient with the curled out edges which leads to prolapse and eccentric AI, it's difficult to do. And then also sometimes if it is too much stressed, the stretched, the cusps are very thin and sometimes there can be minute perforations in those situations as well. They usually do not uh, uh, do the repair. Second, as I said, is uh, assessing the AI. The AI ejects, uh, you know, in this situation, it is central AI. So a lot of times it is due to the dilatation of the sinus and the STJ leading to alteration in geometry leading to the central AI, which is not, not, not a problematic. However, the eccentric jets which imply additional cusp pathology. Uh, this complicates the valve sparing procedures. Next is the root dimensions. Uh, dilated, if the, if the analysis is dilated more than 28, sometimes they require aortic annuloplasty in addition. Number two, a uh, lot of times you might have noticed and we have noticed that we cannot 
really measure the STJ because uh, it's one straight line from the aortic annulus onto sound to the ascending aorta because it's severely dilated. It's difficult to identify and measure. The other things uh, which, are, which can be uh, seen in pre-CPV and can be a predictor or a prediction of success would be what is called as the geometric height and the effective height. The, the effective height is uh, like example at the end of the case, we do what is called a coarptation height. It is a similarly, but it is done preoperatively. Uh, according to, there is a one good study on this. Uh, they said that if the effective height is more than 9 millimeter, the chance of repair is very good. Uh, if it is less than 9 millimeter, uh, the chance of failure uh, is quite high. And also the geometric height of the, geometric height is the height of the aortic valve. Uh, if it is, I think, 13 or 14 millimeter for, or 15, I think, is the is the cutoff. Less than that, I believe, uh, the the chance of repair is not very good. Coming to the post-CPB assessment uh, of this procedure, once the aortic valve repair surgery is done, what, what are the things we need to look for? Number one, evaluation of cusp morphology and co-optation. Number two, residual AI. Number three, root dimensions. And number four, LV function, because they usually uh, re-implant the coronaries coronary buttons are uh, put in uh, into the graft. So as uh, we talked about the four things we'll see, one is the cusp cooptation pretty nice. Number two, if you look at the, okay, it's, it's gone. It's, uh, look at the AI, which is minimal, no AI. And then uh, the other thing we need to look at the LV, LV function later on. So these are the four things we need to look for. And then the important thing here is we look usually for what is called as the coaptation length and the coaptation height, which I'll show you in the next images. So coaptation length is the the side, the length where the cusps are coapting right here. Here, uh, what what have I measured? I measured about uh, I think it, if you see here, if you about one millimeter, 0 0.9 to one uh, centimeter is the length of the cooptation, which is excellent uh, in terms of repair. And cooptation height, you have to come from here all the way up to the end of the leaflet. So as from if you notice from here all the way up to there is the cooptation height, and this is the cooptation length. And uh, cusp cooptation length. In literature, cusp cooptation length more than five is a successful repair, and height more than nine is successful repair, and uh, it should be mild or no AI. And uh, in this study from 2009, that's what they measured. If uh, the cooptation uh, length is less than four millimeter, the recurrence uh, is uh, rate is 47 percent, and the redo rate is 28 percent. And if it's more than four millimeter, the recurrence rate is just 5% and redo rate is 0%. So that is the uh, cooptation length uh, uh, which has been discussed in the literature. Any questions so far? Okay, I'll carry on. Uh, next is the uh, uh, um, the literature which uh, Maral and Dr. David published recently in 2016, uh, their, ex their experience from Toronto General. So it's, uh, uh, I think, over uh, 300 or 400 cases they, they, uh, they, they studied. I think it's more than that. And then if you look at the, they followed up to 15 years. So if you look at the blue, the blue line is the free from reoperation, which is almost uh, like 95% at 15 years. And uh, the red is free from aortic insufficiency. It's almost 90% of patients are free from aortic sufficiency after 15 years of the operation. And uh, this is in the figures in the same, from the same paper, uh, or it's a different paper actually. Uh, if you look five year, 99%, 10 year, 97%, and 15 years, 97.8% free from reoperation in David operation. If you look at the uh, operation, if you compare the same remodeling, uh, five year is 89% and 10 year is 89%. So this is pretty convincing that uh, uh, which operation is better for AV 
repair uh, technique. How does the electric valve sparing compare with the uh, composite valve graft or the bentol procedure? Bentol can be bio bentol or it could be mechanical bentol. Uh, so look here, the uh, the green dots are the uh, aortic valve sparing uh, and the hazard ratio for the bio prosthetic uh, bentol and uh, mechanical bentol. If you look, it, 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 there's no comparison actually. Uh, the valve sparing trumps it in all case mortality in uh, major adverse valve related events and uh, in reoperation uh, the uh, the mechanical bentol is slightly better but in all others others it is the av sparing which is a better operation for these patients so in summary uh, the reimplantation technique uh, uh, or david procedure they are better in younger patients with aortic dilatation in the setting of genetic syndromes and those with larger aortic annular diameter more than 28 millimeter. The remodeling technique or recoup technique is better in older patients whose aortic dilatation is not part of genetic syndrome and this aortic annulus is not dilated. So these are the for the patient selection. With good patient selection, AV repair has shown excellent durability and low risk of AI recurrence and reoperation over the time. That's uh, that's come coming to the first part of my presentation. Any questions on this? Okay, I don't hear any questions, so I'll go ahead. Uh, coming to the next part is the acute aortic syndromes. Uh, these include aortic dissection, uh, aortic aneurysm rupture or contained or non-contained rupture, intramural hematoma and penetrating aortic ulcers. Uh, coming to this, the TE is useful in these situations. They can use to define the size, location and uh, extent of the aortic dissection as well as presence of a hematoma or a thrombus. Uh, it is also very useful to evaluate whether the uh, major aortic branches or arch branches are occluded or patent and to presence and the presence of uh, malperfusion of an organ. It's an important monitoring tool of cardiac function during aortic aneurysm surgery, as you guys are very well aware of. Coming to the aortic dissection, it's uh, the most common cause of death involving the aorta. Uh, if you look, uh, it's a it is a medical emergency or the type A dissection is a medical emergency. The initial 14 day mortality is 50 to 75%. And the risk of rupture increases by one to three percent per hour in the first 48 hours of presentation. And extremely important to diagnose it quickly. And uh, uh, why does it happen? It is formed because of an intimal tear, which is contained by the media, leading to the development of a true and a false lumen. The false lumen may extend into the branches of the aorta, in, in the chest or in the abdomen causing malperfusion, ischemia, or occlusion with resultant complications. The dissection can progress proximally involving the aortic sinus, uh, in fact, aortic valve leading to aortic insufficiency, and may also, the dissection can extend into the coronary arteries leading to ischemic events. So as you know, it's classified as uh, type A and type B, which is stand for classification. Um, uh, type A involves the ascending aorta and type B involves the descending aorta. There is also a Debakey classification, uh, which means uh, the type 1 is it involves both ascending and descending. Type uh, 2 is only the ascending and type 3 is only the descending. But we commonly go by the Stanford classification uh, type A, which involves the ascending aorta and type B, which involves the descending aorta. And in, in, in respect to type A, 90% of the type A dissection occurs within 10 centimeter of the aortic valve. Usually the dissection starts within 10 centimeter of the aortic valve. Coming to the imaging modalities and uh, sensitivity and specificity of uh, diagnosing aortic aneurysm, we know that the first, first uh, uh, diagnostic modality people use is the CT scan. And CT scan has got the highest sensitivity and specificity of diagnosis. 100% uh, uh, sensitive and 98% specific. Uh, TE com com comes uh, pretty close second, 98% uh, sensitive and 95% uh, uh, specific. So 
So there are multiple correct answers which are there. Anybody? Systolic expansion. OK, that's correct. Anything else? There is one answer which is opposite of systolic expansion, which is diastolic collapse, which happens in the true lumen. So, uh, so the correct answers are the diastolic collapse and systolic expansion. As I said, there are uh, two correct options. Sometimes in your exams, they it's not just a single answer question. Sometimes it's like a multiple answers. Like there are two two correct answers, sometimes three correct answers, sometimes all four or all five are correct answers. So make sure you read the question properly in the exam several times. You know, we lose uh, we lose a question uh, by not reading the question properly. So it's very important. Uh, those are the two reasons why I put up this question. Make sure you read the question properly while answering the it's very simple thing uh, which we sometimes overlook and we may lose a few marks uh, in the exams. Uh, coming to the true lumen, as I said, it expands during systole and there's a diastolic collapse. There's a forward systolic flow. You can put a Doppler through that and then you see the systolic waveform, pretty good systolic waveform. And number four, there is absence of uh, secondary thrombus. The false lumen, there are, it's often larger. The diastolic diameter increases, may have a thrombus in it, and you can have a reverse or delayed or absent flow if you put uh, uh, flow through that. Uh, the Doppler flow. This was the case which uh, I did on maybe last week. I think who was with me? Uh, Felipe. Felipe was the fellow. I think Juan was also doing the echo with Marcus. Uh, that was the case here. If you look here, can you tell me which is the true lumen and which is the false lumen? We had uh, we had a little bit difficulty in uh, in. Uh, in diagnosing, but eventually we we we, we got it right. But uh, can you say which is the true and which is the false lumen, and why do you say that? Anybody? The red one. The right one is what? The, the right, the here, what is this one? This is a false. Correct. And this is the true. Yeah, the, if you, the ECG in the, in the OR, we could freeze frame by frame and we could see, you know, this happened during systole, the flow. And as you said, there is, uh, it's flapping around too much because there was a lot of flow in between that and that. But you're right, this is the false flow and there's less flow here and this is the flow during systole. That's one. And other thing, uh, I will mention it later. This is one of the things they ask us when we are helping out for TVARS. I'll come again. If you lead, look at this this structure here, which is bright spot there. That is their guide wire. They wanted to know whether the guide wire is in the true lumen or the false lumen. And uh, you know we debated, and then eventually uh, they also shot an a, they also shot a fluoro means uh, the DSA, and they they knew from there. But also they were asking us. Oh, can you see it's in the true lumen or the false lumen? That is a question they frequently ask us uh, where the guide wire is before they put the stent or deploy the stent. See the pigtail and uh, they put they put the guide wire, they put the pigtail and then they inject the dye to make sure they're in the right spot. They keep asking the question there. Is, you can see the bright spot there, no? See that bright spot? That is the, that is the wire. All right, I'll go to the next. Yeah, true lumen and falsy. It's a nice lamina. If you put the flow like PW or uh, CW, you will get a forward flow. In this, it's all over the place. There's some thrombus in between as well. We could see pretty well last week, uh, you know, the thrombus in the false lumen and the true lumen was beautiful. Coming to the complications of uh, dissection. Complications associated with dissections are aortic insufficiency, which occurs about 50 to 70 percent of the cases. Uh, sometimes you can get coronary dissections as well, 10 to 20 percent. You'll get pleural or pericardial effusion and global LV dysfunction if the uh, dissection flap involves the coronary arteries. 
So here coming to the aortic uh, insufficiency here, as you see, there is an eccentric jet happening. And you can see the dissection flap as well. And uh, some there are other there are reasons for AI in, a, in type A dissection include uh, mal cooptation because the dilatation of the uh, ascending aorta because of the dissection leads to mal cooptation leading to aortic insufficiency. That's one of the cause. Second cause is cusp prolapse. The dissection, uh, the cusp prolapsing into the LVOT because of pushing by the um, dissection flap. Number three, dissection flap per se going through the aortic valve into the left ventricular outflow tract leading to aortic insufficiency. Combination of these uh, can lead to aortic uh, dissection in these patients, uh, aortic insufficiency in these cases. Yeah. This is in the descending thoracic here. This, if you look here, this is the aneurysm extending all the way down. And if you look here, there is a left sided pleural effusion, uh, which they can empty it uh, at the end of the case. Any questions on uh, aortic dissection? Anything to add? Some of you might have seen something different, found something different. Anything have I left out or anything? No? Okay, we'll go to the next one, the intramural hematoma. You know, this is quite common actually. We uh, we do see, you know, in sometimes uh, post decannulation of uh, the aortic cannula, you see sometimes uh, hematoma developing in the uh, in the aortic wall. Uh, usually, you know, it's small and then it's insignificant, and we just leave it alone. That's why we always ask people to to look at the aorta at the end of the case. Is there an intramural hematoma? Is there a dissection after the cannulation? And these are the last images we always do uh, at the end of our uh, case, right? So this is a, you know, this is a very big intramural hematoma. Uh, so uh, what is it? It is a variant of aortic dissection. Uh, the thickening of the aortic wall more than five, this is pretty thick here, 0.5 centimeter. It accounts for 10% to 25% of the acute aortic syndrome. The cause is a rupture of the vasa vasorum in the medial layer. The, the blood supply of the aortic wall is by the vasa vasorum they can get uh, damaged either during cannulation or any other uh, atherosclerosis and whatnot leading to the intramural hematoma. And they are characterized by thick aortic walls without an intimal flap. Uh, it can involve both the ascending or descending thoracic aorta uh, leading to uh, swelling. The hematomas involving the ascending aorta is, uh, is a surgical emergency. It's like a type A. If it is big, they have to go and they have to repair it. Uh, a lot of times, you know, it just accumulates in the a small blood layer accumulates in the media and usually it's a, not significant and we just leave it alone, just observe it. But uh, the problem is it can progress to intimal fracture and leading to frank aortic dissection or aortic rupture. So that's the, that's the problem with intramural hematoma. So there usually, you know, for the uh, NB exams uh, in the PTA, they usually have a question on uh, intramural hematoma. They'll put a picture like this and they'll ask, what is this? Is this an intramural hematoma? Is this a penetrating aortic ulcer? Or they'll give a, a thrombus or something else. So you have to, it's more discernible than this one, uh, what images they give. There is usually a question on this. I've taken the exam twice, both the years I remember having these questions. The next one, uh, which is another uh, aortic uh, uh, pathology is called as a penetrating aortic ulcer. We do uh, see such cases uh, time to time, uh, usually in the abdominal aorta and uh, uh, Tom Lindsay or Tom Forbes, they put a EVAR and they, and they and it's done. So we do see, you know, patients comes with pain and uh, sometimes it extends. The problem is it can cause aortic rupture. That's why they put a stent and cover it off uh, before it causes any more damage. So it's the least common of the problem. It's due mostly due to ulceration of the atherosclerotic lesion and it penetrates through the aortic media, most often in the mid and distal uh, uh, descending thoracic aorta. This common, see, commonly occurs in elderly patients with hypertension, hyperlipidemia and atherosclerosis. And it often, as I said, occurs in the descending thoracic aorta. 
Any any other question? Okay, I'll go to my next. Uh, so these can progress to true aneurysms, pseudo aneurysm, or it can rupture. So these are the complications of uh, penetrating aortic ulcers. Coming to type B dissection. So type B dissection is a dissection of aorta distal to the left subclavian artery. A lot of times it is medically managed. The uh, surgic, surgery is indicated only if there is an ischemic complication or if there is an impending rupture. So these are the two common reasons. Yesterday there was, I think uh, they did a TVAR for a type B dissection, probably due to impending rupture. The one we did last week, uh, type B dissection was due to ischemia of the spinal cord. So uh, there should be some ischemic insult to either bowel or due to spinal cord or to the limbs, then they get the operation or if there is an impending rupture. If it's expanding, then they'll get uh, most of the time it's a, if, it, if it's a good anatomy, they do a T-bar. If not, they'll get a thoracoabdominal aneurysm uh, repair. So this is an example of descending uh, rupture or thoracic uh, aneurysm. Here, you know, I could not figure out which is the true lumen or the false lumen. Can you go, one of you figure out? It's happening simultaneously, you know, the blood flow. Yeah, this one, I, I don't know where I got this clip from, but what do you think, guys? Yeah, this is also, you know, it's tough in this clip, but if we play in single, maybe we'll be able to figure out. It's tough, right? I don't know, can't say. All right, so coming to TE for a TVAR in type B dissection, as I said, uh, one is to confirm the correct guide wire placement in the true lumen. Number two, we can rule out uh, plaques at the proximal neck to prevent uh, endo leak. You can say, oh, there's a big plaque there, aortic catheroma, so they can avoid that, that part of the aorta. Uh, number three is uh, uh, for uh, assessing the retrograde type A dissection during the procedure. This, this was the ask in the last uh, case we, we did. This was the primary reason why they asked for a TE. They want us to know, you know, when they deploy the stent because they were going really high. Almost they covered the left subclavian artery in this situation. Uh, they, were, they wanted to know if they create any retrograde type A dissection while deploying the stent. That was the common reason uh, for, that was the reason they asked uh, for us to do a TE last week. So I have a question. Type one endo leak after TVAR is A, inadequate seal at the proximal or distal landing zone. B, retrograde flow from the aortic branch into the aneurysm. C, structural failure of the stent, uh, perforations or fractures. D, stent graft porosity. What is the right answer for type one endo leak? Anybody? A. That is correct. So, endo leaks, uh, uh, if you look in these answers, uh, A is type 1, B is type 2, uh, it is retrograde flow. So, they put a stent and then uh, there is a retrograde branch, say an SMA or an aberrant SMA or aberrant something bleeding the blood back into the aneurysm leading to dilatation, that's what it is. The structural failure, it's obvious, that is type 3 endoleak. It's obvious like fracture or perforation. And sometimes, uh, you know, the stent graft porosity leads to leak of blood into the aneurysmal sac again. And there is a type 5 as well. 
called the aneurysm expansion without obvious endo leak. It's also called endo distension. Did who was there with Dr. Minkovich today in the operation? Any of your fellows or there was a resident? Because today's case, uh, Leo was discussing with me uh, this morning. Uh, you know, he was telling me, I think the the type because they didn't find any of these problems in that stent. They thought it was due to aneurysm expansion uh, without any obvious cause. So we, I was thinking it's a type five, and they put a second. Uh, I, I think they put two stents with. Perf Fenestrations, I don't know the surgery is done yet. All right, coming to the next topic, the uh, thoraco abdominal aneurysms uh, and uh, TE for it. As you know, the classification uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, extent 1, extent 2, extent 3, extent 4. Extent 1 uh, uh, is uh, from the left subclavian artery up until the renal arteries. Extent 2 is the, the largest one, extends from the left subclavian all the way to the iliacs. This has got the highest risk of all sorts of morbidity and mortality. Uh, extend three, extend from the level of about sixth rib unto the iliacs, and extend four is uh, uh, infradiaphragmatic uh, uh, abdominal, mainly abdominal aortic aneurysm. So the correct answer here, correct statements. There may be two two correct answers. So a. Type 2 is associated with highest complications. B, ascending greater than 4 is an indication for surgical repair. The threshold for surgical repair for aortic aneurysm is less than 0.5 centimeter in patients with Marfan syndrome than normal. And both TTE and TE are good modalities to evaluate the aneurysm involving the descending distal ascending aorta. Distal ascending aorta. So choose the correct statements. A. A is correct, then. Um, B, I think. Ah, uh, are you sure? Or C. C. Yeah. C is correct. A. In any of A and the, C. Yeah. Correct, correct, correct. In any of the, um, in any of the uh, connective tissue disorders, it's 0.5 centimeter less than, you know, normally the threshold for surgical repair. I've got it in my next slide, I'll show you. So these are the correct answers, absolutely right. I told you type two has the highest complications because of the extent of the aneurysm and all the vessels involved, kidney problems, spinal cord, uh, LV dysfunction, etc., etc. So indications for, uh, as I said, surgical repair of thoracic aortic aneurysms. For ascending aorta, 5.5 centimeter. Descending, it's 6.5. Marfans or whatever, then it becomes less. The threshold is half a centimeter less than the regular cases. Okay, why do we need TE for uh, up, uh, during the thoracoabdominal repair? Number one, very important, check for other valves. Because I myself was embarrassed. I had a case years ago about, uh, you know, when we missed, everybody missed uh, in the preoperative evaluation, the patient had multiple valvular abnormalities. Uh, in fact, it was due to endocarditis, um, and we opened the we opened the chest. Means the whole incision was done, and then the echo team was a little bit late to come to our room, and they found a lot of problems in the valves. Eventually, we we continued with the operation. We did the operation, but the the outcome was not very good. So it's better to to fix other things before we come uh, take on this massive uh, exercise. That was an extent to and it was not a good outcome, unfortunately. It was a fault of all, the whole system, we, we, we missed it. That's why, you know, whenever I put a TE probe uh, in these patients, the first thing before the full echo team comes, I do a quick look. I look at other things, so make sure we don't make a big incision uh, only to detect some other problems. Uh, that That's the lesson I learned. Uh, it's a very important for, for us as during the management of the case to know the LV and RV function, uh, volume status during the uh, left heart bypass. Uh, you can guide through the TEE and also guide the cannulation for CPB. That's important. You know, sometimes we have, we have been extremely uh, useful resource in this situation. I'll show you, especially this case. This is one of my cases. If you look here, they were putting the uh, inferior uh, cannula from the femoral vein and uh, uh, they were pushing and it was 
it was even more you know when the push it was uh, impinging on the inter inter atrial septum it was almost tenting like that you know if that push more we might have uh, uh, we might have uh, we might have had a uh, rupture of the inter atrial septum fortunately you know we recognized we said hey guys be careful pull it out and they gently maneuvered back into the mid part of the right atrium so um, that is what they did uh, this time that's it's very important to guide the cannulation even for ecmos and what not they keep asking us it's very important to make sure you know it does not impinge sometimes it, if there's a little hole or pfo it can keep impinging on that and it can go through the septum you have to be careful that so the next uh, topic is the aortic scanning before that i just want to mention that uh, a uh, cerebrovascular accident or stroke after cardiac surgery is a significant uh, event which we all of us who work in icu we know how significant this problem is uh, the incidence in the sur surgical population is about 1.9% uh, in off pump surgeries uh, on pump cabbage it's 3.8% and aortic valve surgery almost 5% it's quite a quite a big uh, risk and uh, one of the major risk factor for perioperative stroke is uh, proximal aortic atherosclerosis or a calcified aorta uh, we always look for this uh, in the descending aorta the Mont montgomery classification but what i mean to say more of more is the use of aortic ultrasound uh, the aortic scanning involves direct intraoperative ultrasound imaging of the aortic arch and the root the intra it's an intraoperative tool for accurate assessment of ascending aortic pathologies and the theromas identification of significant disease by by this uh, all can cause alterations in the surgical procedure right such as we can adopt a femoral arterial cannulation we can alter the site of the aortic cross clamp we can change the type of cannulas used for extracorporeal circulation we can say okay this patient needs off pump coronary surgery or they can alter the site of the graft anastomosis in the aorta based on where the atheroma is so it hence it's very it's very important to know uh, where the atheroma is uh, the aortic scanning is a very important tool for us because as i already mentioned uh, in the earlier part we have a, a window where we cannot see the aorta you know that's in zone 2 zone 3 and zone 4 sometimes zone 2 and zone 3 are where they put the uh, aortic cross clamp so it's very important to make to tell them that there is a uh, calcification usually the surgeons feel the aorta to see there is no calcium but mm. it's not full proof that's where the aortic ultrasound comes into picture these are very high frequency probes they can be linear array sequential transducers or rectangular shaped which gives a rectangular shaped image or a phased array transducer this gives a fan shaped image right now we we also have a matrix array transducers which gives 3d and explain as well in the aortic ultrasound so it is important uh, we need to have a standoff either some saline uh, um, or gel inside the 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 sheath we use so that there is a standoff between the aorta and the probe so you get a good image of the of the ascending aorta and uh, we all know how useful it has been in our uh, recognition of uh, the atheroma and avoiding the cannula at that site so this is a use very very useful image imaging technique all right uh, thank you for listening to this talk and if you have any questions or comments you might have something you might have seen uh, please let me know thank you Hi, Tree. This is Milka. I have a question. Do we yes. measure the geometrical height? No, right? Oh, I'll go back to that. Yes. So it's the valve, the height of the valve, the length of the valve. I I usually don't measure them for uh, for the um, so this is the size of the you know the valve from that's the geometric height. See here, the arrows pointing here. 
Got it? Yes. Yes. And we, I'll send we you don't this paper as well. Usually, Tell me again. We, we don't usually uh, do that measurement, right? We don't. We don't. In this play, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know if any of my colleagues do. I really don't. Uh, I don't even do this one. Uh, but uh, normally, we do the... Uh, for the bicuspid valve, we do the angles. You know, right? Uh, mm -hmm. um, if the angle is uh, is bigger the angle, the better. If it is 120 degrees and something, it's bad. 160, 170 is a good angle. Uh, I didn't, I don't have the slide on this, but I'll show you in the operating room when we measure the angle. So they usually ask for it in bicuspid valves. Uh, if it's a shorter valve, the angle is shorter. If it's a longer, elongated valve, you get a longer angle. It's better for. They believe there's a paper from Europe, I think Belgium, I think, which shows a better uh, outcomes if you have a, a bigger angle in bicuspid aortic valves. So th this paper I will send uh, you guys. Yeah, I I have uh, I have one paper from 2010, I think. That's where I got this image from. Thank I'll you. just look somewhere in my. Uh, desktop, I'll find it and I'll send it to you. But I don't do this measurement. Does any of our colleagues do it? I haven't seen anyone doing that. <clears throat> no? No. Yeah, I me mean, neither. Uh, this is one of them. Not even Dr. Omran. <laughs> yeah, we can check with Ahmed whether he does it, but I. Uh, yeah, I've done several cases with Ahmed that's never mentioned it to me, but uh, this is in a paper, so you guys can, we can probably we can start doing and see, right? I'll send this paper and see if we can, we can try to do them and see what happens, uh, the outcome, etc. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.